Today we are going to cover the basics of electrical firework firing. There are generally two options to choose when you fire a firework electronically or electrically and that comes into the basis of the type of igniter you use. So you either have a talon igniter or an e-match. Now a talon is simply a very very thin piece of wire inside a plastic cap. Now when that wire gets uh, when, when you fire it, which means you, you put a very large current across that very, very thin piece of wire, it, it basically glows red hot. And then that will then catch and ignite whatever fuse is within the tip of the igniter, the tip of the, igniter, the tip of the talon. The E-match, on the other hand, is a similar device in the fact that it has a very, very thin wire in the end of it that then glows. But that's also surrounded by a composition called, generally called pyrogen, although the composition will change from manufacturer to manufacturer. And that wire then ignites the pyrogen that generally causes a much larger burst of uh, hot debris. So normally on talons, you would connect that to a safety fuse such as viscose, which is in retail fireworks. In the e-match, you would connect that to a black powder lift or quick match or some sort of various black powder direct connection. Now if we have a look at the E-match specifications we can see that the resistance of the igniter and cable of a 2 meter, this is of a 2 meter igniter, is about 2.4 ohms. Uh, the no fire current, so this is used for testing and we'll discuss testing in a bit later, is 180 milliamps uh, for 5 minutes or less and if we look at the firing current, it is a pulse of one amp or more, uh, and they say recommend for one amp, four milliseconds, for three amps, one milliseconds. So you basically, we're saying that we need to have over an amp for sure fire current. Normally, you'd say over 500 milliamps for most igniters, over a significant, you know, let's say over a second or so would definitely get it. Uh, for the talons, the firing current time actually is much longer. So usually it's around, it's greater than one amp for over two seconds. So you can see we're not in the four milliseconds or the one milliseconds, we're now in two seconds, which is a much longer time. Normally you'd say for the faulty firing time for E-match is 25 milliseconds is a good time. But we'll discuss why the timing is critical a bit later in the video as well. But let's just quickly go over the basics of the electrical theory of how this is working. We have our igniter. I've just taken the igniter resistance of the match head itself or the little wire. I'm not including the cabling that goes to the to the top of the head. This is just the igniter, which is about 1.2 R, about 1.2 ohms. And if you look, we've effectively got it straddled across the positive and the ground of a power supply. 1.2 ohms is such a small resistance you have effectively got no resistance at all between the 12 volts and the ground, which means you'll get effectively a short, which will rely on a massive current flow. So if you look at our, VI, uh, um, our Ohm's law, we can see that we that we can calculate about 10 amp going, in, going for our igniter. Now that's dependent on the power supply, obviously. If we're only connecting this to a power supply that can only supply two amps, we're not gonna get 10 amps across it. But you can see from Ohm's law that a large current will flow because the resistance is incredibly small. And that's the basics of how uh, we generally fire fireworks, is that we just basically short out a power supply. A very silly, stupid thing to do normally, but the, the, what normally happens is the igniter, once it fires, will break the connection automatically because of the, the actual, you know, the severity of the fuse burning inside it will either just blow all the, the wire out of the talon igniter or the match head will, will blow the little bridge wire um, open generally not always and we'll discuss this again a bit later so in the old days when we used to electrical firing we used to use a nail board and this has many different names actually it's not just called a nail board some people call it a pin board um, and, and the, the, the basics of it is very very simple you get a piece of wood and you place a nail in for each cube or for each igniter you want to fire you what you wire wrap one of the igniter leads to the nail and then all the other lead, the old, all the other end of every other igniter gets connected to the ground of the battery. And then you generally have a separate wand or the clamp of the battery if you've got a big clamp terminal. And you just touch the nails as you want to fire whatever effect is on it. There's a couple of YouTube videos at the bottom I have listed that you can go and see a nail board in action. 
and uh, also how to build one. Uh, we don't really use this anymore. This is just a very old method. But the basics of how you see electrical wiring and how firing works is the same though. So if we're going to move this on to be a bit more precise, so maybe rather than use a flying wand, we want to use a switch, for example, then we would want to put the switch on what we call the high side of the circuit. So this is the side connected to 12 volts. The reason for that simply is because the igniter then is connected to ground and nothing on the other side. So if you were to touch with the open end of the igniter, so the, uh, the end not connected to the ground, you're technically grounded as well. So there's no chance of the igniter firing because you'll generally stand on the floor. And although you have a fairly high resistance in your boots or whatever you're wearing, uh, you're either floating effectively and making no electrical contact at all, or you'll be grounded. And the racks that this could touch will be grounded, etc. So you've just got ground and ground, so no current can flow. If you had the what we call low side switching, so you put the switch on the other side under the igniter, then technically the igniter is always referenced to 12 volts. So if you were to touch that against a rack, you might be able to supply enough current through it because you've got 12 volts going to ground and that might prematurely fire the igniter. So you never want to do low side switching. Although if you look at most Chinese firing systems that I've already shown you on this channel, they are all low side firing, low side switching. So let's go a bit further into this and let's discuss uh, how we can check continuity because continuity is quite common on most systems. Although it is actually generally flawed, the concept of continuity, and we'll discuss that in a second. So we can see here that what I've done is I've added a green LED and another resistor before our igniter. And we can work out how much current we want to flow through the igniter. We know from the beginning of the data sheet it said 180 milliamps, I remember, for less than five minutes or something. That's way too much. We would normally test an igniter between 5 and 15 milliamps. Old systems used to use 25 to 30 milliamps or up to 50 milliamps, depending on what system you're using. But we generally go for the smaller current these days. And let's just look at Ohm's law because it's fairly obvious, but we need to be a little bit wary about how we're doing this because. Uh, usually when you do these formulas, you are working out the uh, the current flowing through the LED. So if we look at Ohm's law, V over I, so 12 minus 2 volts. The so 2 volts is because you've got a voltage drop over the diode. That's what's also known as the forward voltage of a diode. And for a green LED, that's about 2 volts. It will change depending on what diode you use. And then we divide that by the, the milliamps or the current we want. So I'm gonna, I've picked 2 milliamps here. So that means R1 becomes 5K, so we can use 5K there. Now, what does that mean? Because this is the interesting part. So if we have two milliamps here flowing through our green LED, Kirchhoff's current law states the sum of currents entering a node are the same or equal to the sum exiting a node. So if there is our node, we know that we also have two milliamps flowing here through the resistor. And we've got another node here, and we've got two amps entering it, so we know there'll be two amps exiting it, which will mean we have two amps flowing through our igniter there. So we can use this R, R1, to actually change the current flowing through the igniter. So we could make that 5 milliamps if you want, or 10 milliamps. And that will also change the intensity of the LED as well, because it's all in the same series circuit. But realistically, what we want to do is I don't necessarily care too much about the LED. It's the igniter that I care more about. And when you prioritize electrical design, this is quite common. We know for an LED, you probably save up to 20 milliamps. But we don't want to put 20, amp, 20 milliamps through it. We want to put as little as possible through it because we don't want to put too much through our igniter. The less you can put through the igniter, the better, really. And again, we can see we've put our high side uh, switch in. And you can see what I've done is I've connected it from the 12 volt rail down to this junction here. So what happens is we're effectively, when we press the switch, we short that out. So 12 volts now, the power supply will look like 12 volts is actually here at this junction straight across the igniter. So a large current will flow through the igniter when you push the switch because we've effectively shorted out the LED and the current limiting resistor. So when we think about electrical firing, we need to think of some considerations. So cable length to and from the igniter will increase series resistance and create a voltage drop. So we need to make sure that we don't have too long of cables from our power source to our igniters. Otherwise that in turn will lower our potential firing current 
and possibly mean it won't fire at all. So that means our firing current source should really be as close to firework as the possible. And if you look at most modern firing systems, such as the, uh, the small Chinese system or Cobra or Fire One, it's all designed to be sitting next to the fireworks because that is where the current source is. Um, now, continuity does not distinguish between a properly wired igniter and a short, for example, or a highly resistive circuit. So just because you have continuity does not mean the igniter is going to, to actually fire, because if it's a shorted, if it's still shorted, so you've twisted, you've kept the twist in the ends of the E-match, then, then obviously the current will flow through the short and not through the E-match head. So continuity can give false confidence. So really this is where resistance checking is more important. And if you look at uh, any sort of explosive demolition, uh, they do not use continuity checking. They will actually use resistance checking on all of their firing lines, their blasting lines, to make sure that the resistance is correct. Because by the resistance they can see, if they know they have X number of detonators on the line, they know there'll be X amount of voltage drop across all the cabling, then they'll know the resistance effectively because they could also work out the resistance sorry, from the cabling as well. And so therefore, if you have one less detonator, then it will show up because you have a, a lower resistance. Or if you've connected two more detonators than you missed from a different blasting line, then obviously that will show up as a, as a difference in the resistance as well. So in fireworks, we're a bit careless really and just use continuity. But there are better ways of doing it. But the cost increases, obviously, if you want to do that. Um, so also we have to be careful about firing more than one channel at once on a firing system because if you have a short on one of those channels or one of those cues generally you will find uh, a large current will flow through the short because it's less resistive than the other igniter in the other queue so the other igniter may not ignite if you have a short existing on one of the cues that are being fired at the same time as another queue that is often referred to as being a current thief because the short route takes all the current basically and there's not enough to fire the other igniter. And obviously at the bottom there I've said about supplying the firing current for less than the short fire time will result in failures. So you have to make sure you check the data sheet and you get the correct amount of timings for it. So the next thing we want to look at is how do you actually create a system where the current thief scenario isn't a problem. If you fired more than one queue and one was short how can we prevent it? And if you look at this system, what I've done is I've included a high watt resistor, a very low, a very low resistance, but very high wattage, and that's important. So we have a 5R resistor in series with our igniter. So if our igniter ever goes short circuit and we fire that, we've still got a 5 ohm resistor in that line. So it will not pull all the current because you've got the resistance of 5R in there and not a short. And you can work out the the uh, the wattage you need for that. It's quite large on those resistors. Now we often discuss safety of not enabling the firing current at the same time as doing the continuity testing, and this system here shows you that exact principle. So if you look, we have our igniters and our continuity check in series are from the 12 volt supply, but then separate to that, the actual supply to our switch is now from a well this is this is a, a magnetic reed switch up here but that could be a key switch it could be anything so without this being enabled pressing the buttons won't do anything okay so you'd have to enable firepower before you can then press the firing switches and that would actually fire the igniters i've also included a warning when firepower is enabled by a red led in the side there and that's good practice so when firepower is enabled, you have a visual warning as well as obviously a physical system of arming it. So could you do more than one queue without creating huge replication of hardware? And the answer is yes. So if you look up on this circuit, I've got the continuity circuit and the fire circuit is the only circuit we've got up here, but then that's connected to a multi-gang switch. And by doing this, you can see we can actually fire 12 cues individually. We can have 12 cues wired to this by using a rotary switch. And technically, you don't need the high wattage resistor because if you're only firing one igniter at a time, then you've got no chance of the, the current thief scenario. And of course, you can extend this further. You can include banks. 
So here we've got a system where you're going into a first rotary switch, which is your bank select, and then each one of those goes into another rotary switch, which is your queue select. So on this system, you could have up to 12 banks and 144 queues. You can still only fire one at a time, though. You could fire more than one if you created more than one bank with one firing switch or another firing switch, etc. And I've also changed the switch. So it's an illuminated switch rather than just an LED. So you can see when the actual switch lights up and it says fire, then that's clearly uh, active. So this is a, a way you could do uh, a large firing system, obviously still just based through passive components. So what if you wanted to design your own firing system? OK, let's go a bit further than that. So I would do both low and high side FET switching. So not only do you have a switch on the high side, you also have a switch on the low side. So the igniter is completely removed from the circuit when you don't want to, when your power is not on. Or even when it's powered up, it's still not there until you actually get around to wanting to either continuity test it or to fire it. Uh, I'd also do resistance and voltage sensing rather than do uh, continuity testing because we, we know that's more accurate. That will tell you if you've got, for example, an open, uh, a closed, a completely closed circuit, so a short circuit. It will show you if you've got about the right resistance because you know an igniter, if that is connected, will practically pull the power rail next to zero because it's very, very low very, very low resistance. Or if the voltage rail, for example, is hovering, let's say, halfway or higher, then you know you've got definitely a higher resistance, which could be because the igniter is not a good igniter, or maybe you've got uh, too much cabling, etc. You'd also have a system maybe that intelligently disables the queue if there's an error on it, whereas, you know, if, if you don't get continuity in the queue, you can still fire it on the previous electrical systems. You don't need to worry about it. It doesn't disable anything. It's not clever. You also obviously you want to have firepower enable disable current limit on queues. Now this is quite interesting because using the resistor, the small ohm resistor, you, that would be what we call passive control of the current. But you may want so it depends on how many queues you've got firing will change the current flowing through the resistors. If you wanted to actually actively manage it, like for example, like a bench power supply would, you could actually say, right, I only want one amp or two amps per queue, and that's the maximum I want. It would take some extra circuitry. You'd need to figure out some uh, some transistors and that to do that, but that's perfectly possible as well. And you may want to put a very large local capacitor in to maintain the firing voltage because the danger is with this is that when you fire, uh, the power supply will try and collapse in order to try and push as much current through the circuit as possible. And if you're firing over long cable lengths, the last thing you want to do is when you fire is have your voltage drop because then suddenly uh, you have less voltage basically across all your firing lines um, which could then end up causing failures so you don't want that either so that really is a very very quick look at firing systems and the electrical side of firing systems i'm hoping in future videos we'll look a bit more at the electronics side of firing systems and how we can make our own firing system uh, i'm not saying we should go into competition with other firing systems i'm just saying from a a sort of an educational standpoint, we could look at how we could use firing systems, etc., and design them and the processes involved and the dangers. But until next time, I hope that was useful.